Thank you. Um, okay, cool. Um, well, would you give a brief introduction of uh, of yourself and like some of the projects that you've that you've worked on? Uh, sure. So I'm uh, Martin, uh, Martin Zanfleet, and I. Um, well, let's start with video games, I suppose, because cool. that's uh, closest to what's going on here. Yeah. Um, so I started out um, right after college making Volo Air Sport, which is a skydiving simulator. And um, uh, that was basically the first project I worked on uh, for, and for a very long time where I picked up everything I know about um, making video games. Um, along the way, we did some game jams and um, uh, geez, we sort of segued into making uh, VR stuff through Volo Air Sport as well. So what I'm doing now is making um, uh, VR installations, like cinematic experiences that premiere at festivals. And uh, yeah, that's like kind of a whirlwind tour of some some video game stuff I've done thus far. Cool. Yeah, I, ha I had seen another dream. Uh, and I think that that's so cool. Very ambitious stuff. Oh, that's you've seen cool. that. Oh, yeah. Very fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Um, how did you get into uh, doing Volo Air Sport and, and getting into video game design? Because um, you had mentioned on your website that you had graduated with music as your primary focus. So what kind You've of You've done your research. I like I, this. I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how did you switch from... Because I, I also went to college for music, but then switched out of a music degree uh, into... Uh, communications, but it, it was just because I had learned that I had loved the IT side of stuff more. So I'm curious how that looked for you. How did you go from music to video games? Uh, I guess in terms of interest, it has always been both. Like, uh, I mean, you, you grow up with both video games and music these days. It, it's all there. Um, so it's kind of like flipping in between the two. Um, and so for college, I was like, uh, music, I guess, or sort of it came most naturally. Um, but I'd always been interested in computers and, uh, learning about modding tools for games like Unreal Tournament or Quake or something nice. like that. Nice. And programming had my interest as I went through, like I did a little bit of programming in high school, um, and, uh, did some fun projects with friends, like all like very small stuff, but it kept the fire burning. Yeah. Um, and so through college with music uh, and sound design, there was the opportunity to uh, use computers again, but then to make sound. Uh, so then I would be programming uh, synthesizers or samplers or something that produces uh, wavy signals that come out of the speakers. Um, and uh, two, 2010, I guess, is when I graduated. Yeah. Um, so then right around that time, the Unity engine started appearing. Um, it was around for Mac for a little bit, uh, and then I made the jump to Windows. And so for some few final projects I did at college, uh, I was able to be like, oh, hey, let's use this game engine to do cool stuff with it. Oh. And I didn't know how to use it, but it was like, I'm going to figure it out. I know a bit of programming. I know about video games. Let's go. Um, and so through that final stretch of college, uh, I was like, I want to make my first video game. And... Uh, wing seating had just started happening on YouTube. Like yeah. it had been happening before, but that's when it just sort of exploded because you get these GoPro cameras. And I was like, I want to build that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And so I just started making the smallest thing I could. That's really cool. Um, so then um, this was a question I was going to ask later, but um, it kind of works right now. Um, how did you meet? Uh, Michael and Frank and Robin and those guys that have worked on Volo Air Sport and uh, and the Aurora Wager. How did, how did that team team come together? Oh, so uh, some of us go way back. Uh, like Robin, uh, we lived in the same uh, village as like children going to nice. grade school, and nice. um, uh, we'd always kept in touch. Like we went to different uh, high schools and such, but kept in touch for a long time. We would always be playing video games um, and we always wanted to build them. And so uh, when the opportunity for uh, the Aurora Wager came along, uh, we'd already uh, done a game jam together. Uh, he'd done a bit of modeling and Blender and such. And yeah, that worked. So uh, by the time that, that second game jam came along, we were ready to go. Uh, Frank, I know from high school, um, 
and uh, he's also very big on programming, uh, and we would always be sparring about different ways that you could set up a piece of code to do something. And um, yeah, it was a very natural extension to to get him on the team because he was always excited about the stuff that I was doing, and I always really appreciated his insights into programming because he just went different directions with it. Um, and then we made that jump. Um, Michael contacted us, um, I think, through... Man, I forget. But he saw some very early stuff we did on Volo Air Sport, and he, oh. uh, he loved playing it as well. Oh, and he cool. was like, man, we should just be in touch. I think that's how it happened anyway. Yeah. Like, some of these things... <laughs> yeah, a long time <laughs> ago. to keep track. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it might be in terms of audio, Michael, yeah, first worked on the Aurora Wager as a practical thing, I think, and then later on was also uh, around for doing Volora Sports audio. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, okay, yeah, the Aurora Wager, um, which is such a special game to, to me. Uh, I, mm. I have been wanting to make a video on my channel about it since about 2017. I had known about the game since... Nerd Cubed did his playthrough of it, and obviously that video blew up. Um, it and sure I, did. <laughs> yeah, and I remember running the Aurora Wager on a HP DV1000 with one gig of RAM, and I loved it. It was my first experience with like an open world like that. Um, you know, for some younger guys these days, it's like Grand Theft Auto or whatever, but for me it was the Aurora Wager and that atmosphere that – you guys all put together is so special to me. I've been wanting to create a video on this for a long time. Uh, oh man, that is so, that's, I mean, thanks. That's so, so yeah. good to hear. Like, I mean, it's still, the game makes me feel like it's hard to describe how much of an emotional impact it has on me, that game as well. So yeah. it, it it's strange. Like more than anything I've made, I feel like I'm a fan of it too. Like I still that's like cool. yeah. that, that it's, <laughs> It's, it's, I don't know, like I hear artists speak about like, man, I always feel shit about the stuff I make. And yeah. Hold on, I just knocked out my headphones. <laughs> no. um, but uh, yeah, like um, you can feel bad about the stuff you make, even though it's really right. good. But or the Aurora Wager, proud of it or whatever, I don't know, yeah. it was so short. It's like I'm looking from the outside in, it feels like. Yeah. Anyway. Um, That's really cool. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so my question, uh, I have a few questions around the Aurora Wager, um, mostly revolving around its development um, and kind of how you guys came up with that. But it was created for the seven day roguelike jam, correct? That was why yeah. it was made. Had you had you thought of the Aurora Wager or like the, the concept of that game beforehand? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So uh, we saw the jam coming up uh, a couple weeks ahead or maybe months, and we were like, oh, we want to do this one. Um, we were like, okay, do we, is there a theme or no? And what do we want to do? So we took, I think, uh, a week ahead of time, we just met and we were like, we're going to figure out at least a theme and maybe some rough directions to go in. Um, there was like a... We had another friend, uh, Sven, who hasn't worked on the game, but like um, also a friend way back from um, <laughs> uh, from grade school, um, and we were just shooting shit uh, yeah. about you know fun things to uh, to try, and we were looking for stuff outside of regular video game themes or something. Like, mm -hmm. do we want combat in in it or no? Um, and we just went odd directions. Um, I think it was Sven in the end that came up with like the hot air balloon thing because we were talking about traveling, yeah, uh, or different modes of traveling. And then we just riffed on that for a bit, and it started to phew, come alive. So with like an evening with a couple of good hours of that, it just um, uh, we got the rough pitch together. We didn't have a name or anything uh, or <laughs> much of an idea of how we do it. Just that was it. And then the next week we started the jam and we started working on more details. Cool. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the name, how did you how did you come up with the Aurora Wager? Oh, that geez. <laughs> that happened late in the process, I think. Okay. Uh, just like um, like another detail that came very late is uh, like the letter you get at the start. Where yeah. it's uh, Frederick von Nukendorf. It's yeah. C, but I can't pronounce it. That was Robin. 
like in the last few hours, I think just kind of there's the backstory. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think we did the the title, the Aurora Wager, the same because we've just okay. been. One thing we like to do is like dive into all sorts of details on Wikipedia and like see what kind of stuff you find for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Aurora is up north, and we somehow earlier come up with the idea that you know a good way to motivate someone to keep going like a good um that a good trick narratively might just be like there's a bet between old gentlemen and then it was sort of the, just the image of those two things together in the moment oh, it was yeah. the aurora wager see you can get there first that's cool i like that and it <laughs> yeah it was real spur of the moment stuff like that's cool that was it so um the reception of it tell tell me about that and uh, i mean it looks like this was a pretty big game jam <laughs> there were there were over a hundred entries it looks like for it how how was that reception right off the bat and then how did did w what happened with the whole nerd cube stuff i mean tell me about that reception I mean, of it. <laughs> that that was a weird part that was like a wormhole to sort of go through um, so we, we finished it on time and we were happy that it, like it all came together on the last day, really. And we were like, whoa, it actually works. Let's put it online. We have no idea because the term roguelike or the genre, we very, very loosely took stuff from it. Right. So it, it's kind of along the same general themes, but if you think roguelike, Aurora Wager is not what you think about. So we thought right. it would just, nobody would play it. We had fun playing it on the last day that we all put it together yeah. it, we were ecstatic but we were like this is just not gonna connect with anyone because they're <laughs> you know you, you expect a dungeon crawl or right rent. right so we that's our expectation we had fun but that was it and then i mean people left a few reviews i think where they were like whoa this is actually kind of i think this is cool like people were surprised that they liked it you know and some others were like yeah, but this is not a roguelike, which we expected. That was sort of it. Um, so then I think a week later, maybe one streamer picked it up. Like Reverend Scarecrow is a name I remember. Yeah. Um, and they he had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and the, the people watching it really liked it. And I think that's how it got to Nerd Cubed. Yeah. And then, so it was, you know, th that was a nice surprise. The first stream um by scarecrow i was like well that that's probably it then um and then one night a few days later i just wake up um there was like no there was this one odd comment that like gave a little bit of premonition into i think it was someone in the nerd cube community really oh. high up and he he noticed that something was happening so he sent me this foreboding message like stuff is about <laughs> to explode or oh. i forgot exactly <laughs> what it said yeah. I was like, okay, whatever. It's probably nothing. And the next day I wake up and my phone is just like... <laughs> wow. That's so Exploding cool. with stuff. Yeah. Uh, what is this? Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah that was the first time something like that happened. Um, yeah. So then... Um, I mean, you continued to update it a little bit. Um, it, according hmm. to itch, Itch.io, says the last upload was version 4 in 2015. So were you guys working on it for like a whole year and a half after it had initially launched? Oh, no, that's more like um, that might be the first upload date on itch. I'm not sure if it's or maybe we, geez, I forgot when we did version four. But yeah. in my memory, it was more like uh, we did the most in that week. And then we did one or two updates after in like a stretch of a, a couple months. OK, and that's when it. it that's when we stopped. Okay, um, gotcha. And you added the split screen and stuff like that, right? Yeah, that's stuff that we already... Uh, I had a lot of code set up for that beforehand, but it didn't oh, want to okay. come together during the jam. So yeah. it, most of it was in there, like split screen audio is something that I worked on. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I want to talk about your, your specific work with audio later. Uh, um, but yeah, for, for, for now with the Aurora Wager, um, I had a few questions about the actual game and the gameplay. Um, oh. First of all, I've never made it to the North Pole. Have you <laughs> yourself, have you made it to the North Pole? Yes, I have. But okay. I, yeah, 
I have not done it often because it, okay. it, it can take some time. Yeah, it's a little difficult. <laughs> it's 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 a good challenge. It's a, it's a challenging game. Um, yeah, well, that's cool. That's like uh, there's the theme behind it. Um, it's sort of like we felt it during the jam as the thing we wanted to achieve. But like in retrospect, it's really obviously there. We wanted to make a lot of stuff feel like it was out of your reach. And so, yeah, never. I like that you never got there. I'm sorry, but I, yeah. I like it. No, that's, that's, that's <laughs> cool. I've, I've played it. I've played the game probably, you know, maybe like once a year. I like go back and revisit it. And I play it for an hour or so until I fall out of the balloon and then I can't get back in. And I, uh, you know, so yeah. many different people on YouTube have the same experience where they're sitting on one of those islands and they watch the balloon just float away. And it's, it's such a funny experience. But um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like, that's the best stuff. We, yeah. We didn't design it that way. That's just that's just systems working together yeah. to, and we just had enough trust to, that it would do something like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, so uh, the um, the terrain um, oh. is it is it procedural? Is it um, is it manually placed? And then also the wind in the directions is that random and then also the loot on the ground like the hooks and the boxes and the everything is that stuff you guys all place by hand or is it random oh good question um we wanted to go procedural as much as possible so like the the terrain you see uh we wanted to ideally generate it in the game itself but we didn't have time so we cut a corner there and we were like let's procedurally generate it in world machine which is an uh, external tool okay. um i i'd used that on a couple projects before and had some code for getting the stuff into unity so it was like just use that make like four or five variants and that'll do maybe we can replace yeah. it by something nice later but that we didn't have time <laughs> so we we had those and um I built a system in Unity that let me think about a huge world purely in terms of coordinates. Like, you have to sort of fight the engine, or you certainly had to back then. Um, but we just randomly kind of placed these dots in the world, and each would be a random island. Oh. Um, and that's sort of it. Sometimes they would cluster together a little bit more. Um, but that was actually kept kind of simple. And I think if you'd be able to see like a hundred kilometers, you'd see that it's not a very interesting pattern. But mm, okay. because we had beyond a certain range is just fog, mm -hmm. you never see more than one island ahead in the sequence. And it, you know, it kind of feels mysterious that way. Yeah. So, so, so what you're saying is each island then um, was one of these like four or five um, world gen things. And then you used a unity system to place them at different random coordinates yeah that's okay. it that's cool uh, and it would be uh the, the one thing i did try to make sure is that it's like uh the same island suppose you were to circle back that it's not just gone whatever the layout was but it would be the oh. same island in the same place oh so so if you so when you boot up the game and you go somewhere you can fly around for hours and pass that it's not rendered anymore and then come back and then it's still there yeah, though without, like, suppose there, if there were items on the island, uh, we had no time to build in a system that would be like, this item is there, and this item is in okay. that location. So that would all disappear and be random. Yeah. But it was like, you know, while I am writing parts of the code, let me try to get at least some of these things to be consistent. Yeah, that's cool. So then the items then are also random. You could You could find a hook on your very first island, a giant gas yes. canister, or you could be screwed and find a bunch of tiny boxes. Yeah, and uh, okay, that was cool. kind of like uh, that's let part me just of the start out with a yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, um, you know, a lot of games go through these tuning phases where they're like, you know, every island should have something because you don't want people to land there for nothing. Sure. But we had very little time to think about issues like those, and so we didn't. We were just like, we got to get all the stuff up and running. And by the time we had it up and running, we actually liked that some of the islands were completely empty, and the others had like this big explosion of all kinds of stuff at once. Yeah, that's cool. 
Um, that is cool. So then it is true, case to rest. My friends and I have been arguing about this for years, but it is true that every time you boot up the Aurora Wager and you start a new journey, that is that is a unique journey that is unique to that play session. Yeah. That's cool. Um, or, I mean, on a technical level, how do you mean? Yes. Like, no, I just mean like the terrain, the items, um, the wind. The terrain, the items, the wind. Oh, you know what? That's actually a an interesting question. I'd have to... I'm going to have to promise to look that up and get you the answer oh, okay. after this. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Because it's like, um, there's a... Um, I don't know if you... Uh, so random number generation, you kind of set like an initial number for the thing to go with. Right. Uh, like the seed is what they uh, call it. Right. And so with a lot of things like the terrain placement, if you have the same seed on startup, yeah. you should get the same layout. Right. But I don't remember whether I randomized that on startup. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I think with item placement, though, that is probably random every time you boot it up. Okay, cool. That's cool. All right. Um... Is that shed light on some things or <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's unique. I had I had wondered for a long time if it was the kind of thing where if I played it enough, I would start to recognize, okay, the third island west is always has a hook on it and I can rely on that or or something like that. Is that in there? Okay. I don't, no, I so don't it... think it is. Okay. I think it's I think it's different every time. I hadn't I haven't played it enough. It's you know it's it's uh it's difficult and every time i go a different way <laughs> yeah that i mean it's tough to go exactly the same route i think yeah. i i would be man that's a fun thing to think about for yeah. like re rebooting it like having challenges or at least being able to see yeah, can you trace the same cool. path or right. is it just really difficult yeah yeah <laughs> for sure um so then yeah if if you were to do a uh remaster so to say um what would you want to include? What kind of upgrades would you do? Would you aim for a Steam release like Volo had? What? Uh, how would you, how would that look in your eyes? I've been wondering about that since making it. Um, like we all have. Um, like everybody who who worked on it and was around it has been like, what are we gonna do? So that's a huge huge question. Like, yeah, um, it is. I, I'm a I'm an avid I, I keep notes of everything I do. I, I write very meticulously, like on the Aurora Wager, in terms of like just sheer stuff I've accumulated and, and written and like clippings from the internet, like Wikipedia pages, everything. It's a like this weird sprawling design document that you could fill multiple books with at this point. It's it's embarrassing how much it is. <laughs> it like this this game has been weighing on my mind every i don't know every month of every year like it's almost call me a little bit weird about it but sometimes it's like the universe asks me like when are you gonna fucking do this because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like i love it everybody everybody's in love with this strange balloon game and i'm like yeah obviously that needs to be made somehow i kind of hope that other people would have made it now and it's cool mm. to see that uh lots of other people have done similar kinds of games and taken the like the the travel thing further and sure. given it uh, like there, there's other people working on similar stuff so <sighs> the thing is um it comes from a time where i was um how should i put this um I had a lot of personal baggage and stuff to work out, um, and I guess uh, some behavioral difficulties. Like, uh, I would be obsessively compulsive about something, and that would get in the way of getting things done or making choices that would make a production go forward and, you know, come together in, in the end within a finite sure. amount of time. Yeah. It was a huge problem for me, and um, the Aurora Wager... Um, we're lucky that we had that week to do it because um, that, you know, that we could see the end no matter what would happen uh, after that week, that would be it. Right. That's why that got made. But after I would let my or personally, I let my curiosity just go in all kinds of directions, pull it in and all that stuff got sort of lodged into the label, the Aurora Wager. So it became like the 
impossible to build infinite game. Yeah. Then I had to let that go completely, and now it's a couple of years since I kind of done that, and I revisit it, and I'm like, okay, what's what's left? <laughs> mm, right. What like what what is the strongest stuff? Um, That's fair. That's fair. But then still, when I have to get down to the brass tacks of okay, well, what do we build and and how? Um, I still don't quite have it together in a way, or it seems like. You, it's like one or two life experiences away from being able to make some choices there. Sure. feels strange that way. Um, Cause I, I've gotten into things like climate science because, you know, simulating the atmosphere was important for that one. And I'd want to do, I want to give that more. You'd want to do that. Of an, of an angle to that. And right. Right. And so like when I, there were all these themes wrapped up in it that I sort of knew I felt strongly about, like, climate science, but also the political side of that, um, ecology as a theme, uh, we'd want, you know, to have some life on the islands or in, in the space in between. Yeah. And if you already have an atmosphere simulation, why not think about the, the creatures in it? And so it becomes this no man's sky, like proportions kind of thing, sure, sure. which was also happening at the time. And I saw what was happening with Sean Murray and I was like, Oh, um, yeah. That I was even like the Aurora Wager is good, but suppose I went that route and I got all the Sony money, that would probably I don't know if I could handle that because again right. I, I felt like I I wasn't able to deal with stress all that well, but the obsessive compulsions led me in all sorts of directions. I was still a mess. I was like I don't think I can do this game if it's like if it has to be that. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> that's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Um, anyway, so like, uh, that, it's a complicated story, but yeah. thanks for asking that question. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It, in, yeah, in some ways, I, I, I suppose it is, uh, it is a uh, snapshot in time of, of uh, what was special about game jams at that time. And of course, you as a developer, your strengths and your weaknesses. And, and if that's special and you, and, uh, and you don't want to touch it, then, then you don't need to because it's already great on its own. Yeah, I was happy to just leave it there yeah. for a little bit. But yeah, I things are different now. Sure. And um I've worked on like a lot of projects that have that beginning and end to it and like I've seen different parts of production cycles, played different roles through it and most of all I had the wonderful opportunity to work with a lot of people who do have that kind of shit together more. <laughs> so I've had sure. like lots of mentoring figures along the way. Yeah. So you know, it it's that's why I'm happy that that you suddenly popped up and were like, "Hey, can we talk about the Aurora Wager?" Yeah, it's like, "Oh, wow, yeah!" Like I, I do feel like a different person now, certainly from back when I made it. Sure. Wonderful opportunity to reflect and see, like, okay, where would it go now if it was twenty twenty one? I'm yeah. gonna flip the question right back at you, actually. Okay. Like, what is it? And you, you and your friends, because you like you part of the fun is like the, having the experience with multiple people like what's yes. what would you go ahead <laughs> um goodness yeah that's a that's a great question i really like your your idea of addressing the space between the islands that is incredibly ambitious and that really does become like a um goodness what do you even do there do you make it dangerous do you make it like a time limit kind of thing um, have you, have you heard of, or played like the outer wilds? Have you heard of that one? Yeah. I, that game is amazing. Yeah. So some, <laughs> some system kind of like that, would that be implemented? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think for me, and, and I don't know if I can speak for, for anybody else, but I know for me, the, the most special part about that game is, is, uh, the atmosphere and it's, and the, <laughs> mix of it being beautiful with the music and everything but then also so ominous and at any point you could just fall out and mess up and then it's game over and so there's there's yeah. stakes to it um i don't know i don't know how a remaster would look without it being overly ambitious and then you end up in early access hell and it ends up just kicking your ass but it's like um but it's interesting that you you noted a couple of important angles there and i think 
um, more than making like a No Man's Sky-like thing, it might also, this is why I like the VR cinema work. They're focused experiences yeah. and you know, they don't just sprawl out of control because you can't keep your audience for, for an infinity of time. Sure. Um, so that makes me think like something like the Aurora Wager, it doesn't have to be this completely procedural go anywhere you want uh, right. type of thing in order to do the things that it did. Um, right. What I like about it is indeed, yeah, atmosphere is hugely important. And as long as you focus on building more like mood pieces instead of, you know, Giant simulating the entire world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really is. That That's a great, that is a great uh, kind of not, not nail in the coffin. What am I trying to say? Like uh, anchor is like mood pieces rather than giant set pieces. You know, that, that mm -hmm. really is what makes it special, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I've come to, I don't know, I was a very agnostic person in terms of uh, religion, but spirituality has found its way into my life. And I guess it has always been. I just feel more comfortable saying something like that right now. But, yeah. but Buddhism has, has a big role in my life in terms of, I don't know how I view things. Yeah. Um, the game, I see it as a very Buddhist game. And like, uh, I okay. think you learned a lot about in Buddhism is all about um, letting go of things, letting go of expectations, letting go of control, not like completely surrendering yourself to adverse circumstances or anything like you, you have some agency in life, but don't overestimate how much control you can or should have about things. And the Aurora Voyager, you you Balance go up and down in the perfectly. balloon, and yeah. the rest is the That's the true. wind. And uh, I see there's this playthrough of a of a smaller YouTuber, also like eight years ago. Um, he, like many other people, I think he visits an island, and then there's nothing there, and he's a little bit frustrated with it. He gets up in the air again, and then he's just like, "Let me move the compass from here." To oh, oh, and it. It drops overboard, yeah. and that moment catches him off guard. And instead of like being frustrated with it, he just goes into this deep belly laugh. Like he he almost he's very surprised that this thing happened, and he's just he exits. He looks at himself, and he's like, "Oh my!" <laughs> and he um, he doesn't recover. He tries to compose himself again, but that deep belly laugh comes out again multiple times, and he it just. It's beautiful, and everybody in yeah. the comments is like, "Oh my god, that 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 laugh!" Yeah, <laughs> that moment. Yeah. So yeah. there's the the letting go. There's accepting like mistakes and for forgiving yourself and uh, trying to have fun along the way in spite of losing all this stuff. Yeah. Very Buddhism. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. That is very cool. It is it it is a it is a um in that in that sense a very um uh insightful game and i think that's that's special about it that's very cool cool that's that's all the questions i had about the aurora wager i had some other uh questions uh if you wanted about other other projects and stuff that you've worked on um obviously i would assume that if you were to make an aurora wager something you know a remaster or another uh capsulated project uh, you would want to make it VR. Is that, I mean, you'd, you would want it to have VR capabilities. I, I'm i still tempted to say no, but oh, I, I okay. think I'm going to have to say yes. VR is complicated for me. Uh, yeah. VR is complicated for everybody, I guess, because it's, sure. um, it's been changing things. So, um, uh, yeah, I do a lot of work in, in VR cinema now, and uh, I see how that reaches different audiences, but also reaches the same audiences in a different way. Um, the expectations are different and specifically, uh, like I, I don't like Facebook. I'm just going to put it that way, but yeah. Um, the Oculus quest two is a fantastic platform, like hardware wise, the tracking yeah. is rock solid and it's wireless. You can just, pop that thing on in the living room and then you're somewhere else. Yeah. It's Incredible. magnificent. That and the Aurora Wager, it's easy to see those two things kind of married together and working out. Um, I have um, like 
early VR caused me a lot of stress because with Volo Airsport, we jumped into it not really knowing what we were doing. And we were yeah. doing it like both desktop PC controls, but yeah. also VR. And that just split us in two different directions that we had to keep real simultaneously. And yeah. we couldn't at the time, or it was one of the things that made it difficult for that game. Yeah. Um, but if you were to just take something like a cinematic Aurora experience and focus it on a VR device, that I, think, I think that could be incredible. like, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Well, glad we worked that out. Yeah. There, there we go. There we go. Um, it's something for me to pitch. <laughs> yeah. If, 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 if you wanted to, I think that's so cool. So yeah. T um, if you want, uh, Tell me a bit about Volo Air Sport. This, this is a game that I did not have a personal experience with. I have never played it, um, but I knew about it when the Aurora Wager was coming out because I had looked into your stuff. I had seen on Steam early access stuff in 2014. So uh, it, it sounds like it was a big learning process. And I and I I've seen other people who have expressed mm. frustration with it, but I have seen other people who have expressed how amazing it is. There's nothing else like it. Um, what was that journey like for you? I mean, that was a seven year long passion project of yours. Yeah, I really got to know myself quite well throughout that process. Yeah. Um, uh, um, give, wow. give me, give me okay. like the, give me like the, the, the two minute, um, like the two minute up, up and down of just like the, the, the plot, the arc of that game. The up and down. What, okay. Yeah. So, what, what happened where you guys just dove so far into it? You threw the VR in there. You were promising multiplayer. It was crazy. And mm -hmm. then what ended up happening where it was like, no, we, we, we do have to close this and we got to move on. Good. Well, now I finally get to tell that story. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So, obviously, crazy passion project. And um, I treated it, I guess I always treated it as like a way for myself to grow and um, like try and find new game mechanical ideas or different expressions that you wouldn't usually see in simulation or sports games. Uh, and I wanted to go all the way on it to the point that I like really hyper focused on just the feel of the character in the wind. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, made that difficult, of course, is we also pitched it as a commercial project and we had like a whole player base that was, you know, they, they love the game, but they want to see it grow. They also wanted to work on their computer. Just the realities of yeah. actually building a video game um, it, in that commercial space did not marry well with my hyper focus on just wanting to endlessly fuss about with the details of the simulation. Sure. Um, so uh, beyond that, we always felt like the game missed a certain direction or focus to it in terms of like a, a gameplay structure around it. Like, do we work with narrative? Do we add game types? What do multiple maps look like? And that structure never really wanted to materialize. Um, which is um, a thing that over time we started burning ourselves out um, with that. Because, you know, you work harder because the thing isn't working out. So right. you work harder because the thing isn't working out. We did that for a couple of cycles until finally I personally was like, I can't do this anymore because I, I have too much trouble functioning as a, no as a normal human being. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was the point where we quit. It was it was difficult because I'd wanted to explain to everybody what was going on, but I was so closed about these things that to just open up about it there and then while I was in a very fragile state, that seemed yeah. impossible. So we yeah. just kind of shut it down and then we're like, you know what? Um, forget about it. We'll see. Um, yeah. So that was... Um, I don't know, I carried some shame with me afterwards or a guilt sure. for, for doing that. But I'm also glad I did it because going yeah. on the way we were with it at the time was also just not an option. Not we, had, we just had a lot to learn. So yeah. we just had to humbly be like, OK, we that was uh, a bunch of mistakes along yeah. the way or, sure. you know, um, not mistakes, but 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 incredibly ambitious and, and mm. wore you guys down, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did learn 
we learned so much along yeah. the way. And it's like, uh, would I trade the experience for something else? No, I'm I'm glad how that w with how that went. And you know, every people did love the game. And yeah. he, like you said, there's some people who bounce off of it the one way, but others are like, wow, this is this is skydiving to me. I didn't know a computer yeah. could do that. Yeah, 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 that is really cool. Um, that Sorry, is, that was more than two cool. minutes. No, 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 that's that's totally okay. I think, I think if I had more of a personal experience with the game rather than just seeing the trailers, um, I would have more to ask about it and more to talk about. Um, that, that was the same team as, uh, the Aurora Wager, right? Uh, so Frank was not on the Aurora Wager, but on Fuller Air Sport. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, Robin was there and Michael Manning was on there as well. Yeah. 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 Cool. So that really was a mostly, mostly solo project of yours then. Is that correct? Um, Polo, you mean? Volo, yeah. Yeah, it, it started out as a thing I did on my own for a couple of years. And okay. then Frank was like, okay, let's do this. Let's try and make this into a commercial, commercial. thing together. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> uh, then Michael was on board quickly as well. Just like whenever you need audio, just yeah. text me. Yeah, cool. Um, when that when that first was put up on Steam, how, how much was it? Uh, we put it up for, I think, $20 or 20 euros, something okay. like that. Yeah. Then we got some reviews that said, like, look, it's good, but is it $20 good? <laughs> and that made us reconsider. Um, so we went to something like 15 I think, or okay. something like that. And now it's... We knew nothing about video game pricing. We had sure. no idea. <laughs> sure. And now it's, now it's $1, right? Yeah, like when we uh, quit working on it, I was like, I want to leave it on Steam, but also yeah. communicate to people that, you know, this is not being worked on. And, yeah, you know, cool. if you think it's worth one dollar, just then here do it is. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I, I think it's worth a lot more than one dollar, especially the actual just physics of it. I think that's very cool. Um, I have yet to buy it, but it is on my uh, follow list on Steam I, and I might look into it sometime later. I might make it free. <laughs> uh, that'd, be, that'd be kind of fun. Um Anyway, very cool game. I, I think that's I think that's a very neat project of yours. Um, uh, how? Here's another one. Here's another uh, kind of question. Jumping jumping away from Volo, or maybe not jumping away from Volo. Mm. How did how did you come up with the name of uh, Ramjet Anvil? Uh, does that hold any significance to you? Or um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I wanted to do something that was an anagram of of my name. Um, oh. So I used an anagram finder to find different words that would use up the most letters. So I find oh. found ramjet, which has to do with aerodynamics and flying. So I knew that. And anvil was like, you know what, engineering? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of squished those two together in my head, and it looked like a funny picture. I yeah. went with that. Cool. I, <laughs> that was All it. All right. Yeah, that's cool. I, I think it's a cool name. So that's why that's why I asked. Um, now, other than the um, VR cinema stuff that you've been working on, um, I came across this little video that has 200 views on YouTube, and I think it's the coolest thing in the world. It's called Club Ramjet Prototype. And uh -oh. holy moly, the freaking virtual acoustics, the, the, the binaural audio, that is incredible. Are you going to do anything with that? Do you have any hope for that? um so uh that is part of my sprawl of like unfinished side projects <laughs> okay okay cool <laughs> but it's like um i was doing that while i was take, sort of taking a break from uh freelance work and such i was like i just want to explore some new technology or directions and like uh i'd always been interested in the audio simulation aspect because we have ray tracing and visuals and y you can do yeah. interesting things with that right um and you know ever since from college and sound design and programming there was like it's theoretically possible to have good reverberation that actually you can hear where stuff comes from or you can yeah. hear that stuff's around a corner yeah um somehow it took until now for that to kind of show up but then um like this is uh, based on steam audio so somewhere okay. at valve uh i think they they're working with some university people as well they were just quietly putting this stuff together um 
and it it launched not too very big acclaim or anything. They were just like, hey, we have this VR audio package. I, I just read the notes and it says, we have advanced reverb simulation that takes into account the geometry of the space and material properties. Yeah. Like, it's nobody seeing this. Yeah. It's here. This is like, my dream it, since 2010. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I knew I had to do something with it. Um, and I, uh, like two years before that or so, I had done my own little fake reverb simulation where I was like, if I have a club, you know, the, the low frequency bass comes rumbling through all the walls and such. So you hear right. it directly. But the other stuff that's coming out of windows or doorways or hallways, you kind of hear that later and it has different character. So I kind of smooshed that together with some hacks and I was just impressed by how it sounded if you treated it that way. Yeah. So I, I knew, yeah, okay, I can do a club scenario. Let's just go with it. Also yeah. COVID had started happening. Oh yeah. And I was right. like, um, I, I like partying. I don't go often. Yeah, yeah. But I, I speak to friends who, who then are also like, especially when we're still figuring out, like, do we do masks or not? And nobody was vaccinated. There were no parties. And even yeah. if you don't go that often, it's like, after a while, you're like, man, I just want to go to a club. To a club, and... yeah. Hear the audio bumping through the walls. Yeah. Yeah. And feel that in your chest as well. Yeah, and just totally. be dancing with a lot of other people. And just, oh, you miss that after a while. Yeah. So I was like, um let me let me make that let me yeah. let me try and get as close to it as possible because this tech can do it also <laughs> and that's the fun personal story um like uh there was a a girl involved as well and i was like i want to impress this girl i want to dance with this girl in a club yeah and there are no clubs i'm gonna build my own I'm goddamn gonna club and i'm gonna dance with this <laughs> if girl. i can't go so to one i'll make one <laughs> yeah yeah so I did that, and then we spent like an evening, uh, like dancing with the the virtual acoustics uh, together, and that oh, was awesome. an amazing experience, and that made it completely worth it. And I was like, let me spend two more months on it and just see how far I can take it. So that's yeah. how that came together. Wow, that is really cool. That's a really cool story. Um, it I noticed it's not on your um, works part of your website, um, and it's not. There's no like download for it. Is that because of like audio licensing issues or like what, um, how come it's not available? Um, maybe I should just make it available. <laughs> I mean, that'd be cool. I, I, I was, have a, yeah. I was thinking so that I, I would love to... to toy around with it um, myself. It's, I have no um... programming knowledge, but it seems cool. I'm going to do that. So like I fired it up the other day after not seeing it for a couple of months and I upgraded the toolkit and like the oh, steam cool. the steam audio stuff it's a bit more advanced now maybe also hopefully more stable. One of the reasons I was like I can't immediately release this is cuz um like real time processing power required to get it to run at like a, a level of detail that I'm like yeah now I can hear everything the way I want to. Mm -hmm. I have a fairly beefy rig sitting here and it's like just to out. keep the yeah yeah and that's just for the audio right um that that stuff if it has like a couple of passes on the software from the from the valve team and like it matures a little bit i think yeah. that cost is going to go way down and the quality is going to go up in Improve. terms of what you hear yeah that's cool so i was like i'm not quite sure um also yeah. i was working on the i had an ambitious plan for this i i either go ambitious or bust something yeah. like that sure um, so I built in uh, online networking components um, oh. so you can actually meet people in the club and have artists playing in the club. Wow. Um, so um, so it's very much I've... still a work in progress and yeah and, uh, so like yeah <laughs> I have a bunch of commercial uh, things going on for like the next couple of months but then I'm gonna get another one of these few months gaps where I'm like, am I going to fill this up with more freelance work? Or maybe yeah. now it's time to go for the club or maybe now it's yeah. time to go for the Aurora wage or VR thing. Yeah. It's like, that, that's kind of how I play with these different things. Yeah. I, that's very cool. That's how far I've gotten. That's cool. So you are, you are then a full-time freelancer. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. That's nice that or, you don't have to have like a day job or, or uh yeah, that is my day job now office job. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. It's uh I didn't know it was 
for a for a while I was naive about it and thought, oh yeah, let's do it. It'll be easy. And then I was like, this is hella hard. I'm not earning <laughs> nearly enough, and I'm breaking my back. And then yeah. um, after a while, you do start to get it. It takes time. Um, so now I'm finally lucky that I know this club of similar people in the VR cinema business. Yeah, and that's really cool. Like um, the the business here in the Netherlands, it's it's getting kind of smaller. Or after a while, you've just met everyone, and it's like, oh, let's work with them on this project. Let's work with them on this project. Um, I feel very happy that that happened. It's only again very recently that that came together. That's cool. Okay, I have two last questions for you. If you have time, uh, I do. Yes, and these these are just kind of silly. Um, I was wondering, do you have a favorite project that you've worked on? Could be as big as you want or as small as you want, but like something that you are, uh, it was the coolest development and you're so proud of it, like your favorite thing. <laughs> I'm not sure. I always, one of the things I have is that if I, because you work on these things with other people and I'm like, that project was really cool because I work with them and that project was really cool because I work with them and they were different but similarly cool. It's like, well, I'll, I, I'm just going to say it, like the Aurora Wager. The Aurora Wager was so, so damn special. Like, yeah. and again, that's due to like how I relate to it as a fan myself as well. Like Volo Air Sport, I have like, as an engineer, I look back at it and I'm like, yeah, but in terms of like raw emotional feel, I'm not as connected to Volo Air Sport as with the Aurora Wager. That was like having sure. a baby or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, and then last question. Um, do what uh, is kind of a two part question. Do you do you still do you play video games? Are you still a player? And if so, what are some things that you're really enjoying uh, right now, like some of your favorite mm. games? And then also, what games like from your childhood um, influenced you and stuck with you and are like really important to you? Like your top three, mm. you know, like really influential games. So um, I still play video games. I do, though, as I um, it's the thing I hear a lot from game developers, I guess, as well. Like, the the more we make stuff, the more quickly we read stuff when we pick it up. And it's like, yeah, I already played something like this before. You know, the, the yeah. game, you can get kind of fatigued by playing the same stuff over. And um, But there's lots of stuff that comes out that does defy your expectations, no matter who you are. And it does that to me as well. Um, so something that I'm very fond of, of course, is uh, the Pathologic 2 um, and like the, the Pathologic series. OK. Um, do you know those games? No, I haven't heard of it. Let me look this up real quick. OK, I can give you like a, a, a short pitch or my okay. version of it, because um, so it, maybe I should just lead with it's Eastern European. So it's about suffering. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's. Um, uh, you're a doctor. Here. You enter this town, um, a small town, and your um, your father has just died under mysterious circumstances. Everybody suspects it's you. The town closes up, goes into quarantine after a while, because uh, there's this um, there's this pandemic, um, and uh, you get to experience this town over uh, a series of fourteen days. Um, as it kind of, one, starves itself out because there's no more contact with the outside world as people start banding together or turning against each other. There's a lot of spiritual and mystical angles in terms of different tribes and some magic stuff in the background. Yeah. Um, many different storylines running in parallel together. Similar like the Aurora Wager, you can never experience everything. Like the clock just goes forward and events happen, fates are sealed as you go, whether you're there to affect things or witness things or not. Um, it feels frightening to, yeah. to play. It's it's not it looks, fun or enjoyable. It um, it's um, like I said, suffering right away. It, it can feel that way as you go. The game can be brutal, um, yeah. but it that captured me like few other games have. Um, cool. One game that did do that was uh, Rain World, 
by a video cult. Rain World. Ooh, I like the art style of this. Oh, you yeah. made a mod. You made a mod kit for this mod loader. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen this before, but only in only because I've looked at it in relation to what you were working on for it. Oh, it so for, for uh, research for this video. <laughs> so um, I have um, I, I've been a longtime fan uh, of Rain World, the game, uh, along with a friend of mine called Jeroen, whom I also know from from college. Uh, he makes video games. Uh, Jeroen Stout. He makes cool stuff. Cool. Um, so we we were hyped fanboys surrounding Rain World because we both like ecology and like uh, game AI that is fuzzy, where you don't quite know whether an NPC is alert or not, or you don't know how they will respond. Like maybe they're hungry this time and that changes their behavior, or maybe there's two of them now and they feel more confident. Rain World has an ecosystem in which you exist as a small, relatively fragile, but nimble creature. Um, and you don't get like power ups to get stronger. You just get more knowledge about the world and how these creatures in it behave and interact. Yeah. Um, and just the experience of, you know, first being like a, a, a vulnerable little slug, slug cat, cat thing. Yeah. Uh, and then gradually becoming more mature in existing in that world and then exploring it and figuring out where it comes from. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really cool. So That's, those are really cool. two examples of stuff. When that kind of thing comes along, I'm like, yes, let's go. Yeah. Um, so games from from before, from from early life. That I think it was the other part of the question. Yeah, that like stuck out to you and made you want to go into video game design and video game uh, development. Um, hold on, I'm fixing an audio thing. No problem. No problem. <laughs> uh, can you can you say something just so I know can I, that I can hear you? Check check one two three four five. Hello hello check check. Oh there we go. Okay okay like cool cool cool. Block. Yes okay so uh, the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Awesome hands down. <laughs> like yeah. there's a lot of stuff, but um, I was like ten or twelve when I played that. I forgot exactly when it came out. That game changed my life. <laughs> um, that was the first thing I picked up where I was you know the the that game for me in a personal experience to find what immersion is like i think yeah about that game wow i just <laughs> and like link as a character as well i i i like that <laughs> yeah i just like that a lot i like what what link represents um and i've always looked to that as like wow i want to be a little bit more like link <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool. um um also first bad guy like Ganondorf where I was like whoa like I don't know the whole concept bad guy was yeah, really yeah. real to me for the first time in that one so yeah, <laughs> yeah. a lot of the theater of it was also and it, that game definitely <laughs> yeah cool that's awesome well thank um, you so much I mean that's uh that's all the stuff I have um I do have uh a little bit more time if there was anything you wanted to go more into detail on um but, I have more yeah. time as well, but so we can, uh, yeah, we can just shoot the shit for a bit. <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, you asked about, or you wanted to ask about the wind simulation as well. I seem to remember skipping over it in favor of the terrain. Okay, yeah, I, I did. I was wondering how that works, how the balloon interacts with it, and if it was random. Yeah, it's it's random. Um, it's done using something like uh, Perlin noise, uh, probably. So Perlin noise is uh, an algorithm invented by someone in like the 70s, I, if I'm guessing. I don't quite remember. Uh, in, in Hollywood, the visual effects industry, to do all sorts of natural effects. So it's random, but it's smooth random. Oh. Um, and people use it for like terrain generation or something. Yeah. Um, uh, turns out you can also do that to create a field of wind that kind of smoothly varies in different directions. Yeah. And um, I used um, multiple octaves of that. Or like octaves are just like in music where you have a low frequency that's like a very broad strokes idea of where the wind would be going in this case. 
And then you get higher octaves that get more detail or deviation, so yeah. little flutters. Um, so there are several of those layers stacked together, and they determine at every point in space, like this is where the wind is blowing, this direction or that direction. Um, and so all the physics objects in the game, like the balloon and uh, all the all the boxes and everything, yeah. they each have a little script on them that can ask, what is the wind doing here? And that translates to a force that is used to push uh, stuff around. And then to give the world shape, we had to figure out, like, well, how do we change the wind to, for, depending on where you are? Or um, you want it to change a little bit meaningfully as you get higher up and down or go very far north or south. Right. Um, so one thing we did was we kind of imagined uh, in a giant plane, the whole world, we thought the North Pole is in the center. So that's like at the, if it's like a graph, it's on zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you start kind of on the outer reaches of this world where all the wind is roughly pointing north. So everything is blowing you inwards oh, towards it. Oh, okay. But then as you get closer to the North Pole, um, like that influence that pushes you inward starts dropping off. So the wind starts meandering oh. a little bit more. And that's why the North Pole is also actually hard to reach. Like you don't get the same push you did at the start in the same direction. And so yeah. you really have to, at that point, figure out, oh, I need that little stream in order to get a little bit more that way. And then because the North Pole is centered at the world and it's like completely... Um, uh, th there's no more push inwards whatsoever. It's right. actually very difficult to land on sometimes. That's um, cool. Yeah, so there's, I think that's the broad strokes of the wind. Yeah, that's really cool. That makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense for a difficulty curve, uh, approaching the final destination. Yeah. Yeah, there was also like while we were programming, it was like um, th that kind of came up as a natural progression. And then we just left it that way. And we didn't know if we'd be able to get there. And that yeah. was f fine with us. In fact, in the first release, I don't think you could. You could get to the North Pole, but there was a bug. Uh, I think people called it like the death wind bug or the death oh. vortex bug. So this same effect that was like um, pushing you to the center and then yeah. falling off as you got to the center. I think we let that go into the negative somewhere or into divide by zero. So there would be this wind that would be going to the North Pole and then pull you down to the ground. Oh, wow. Um, and people were kind of struggling with it and were like, it's so close. I can almost touch it. Yeah. But the balloon would be stuck and they would be firing the burner to try and stay up and then they would just die. Oh, my goodness. That was... Um, you know, that's the kind of bug you want to leave in or make official yeah, somehow. <laughs> totally, yeah. Like a to like a tornado or a vortex or whatever, yeah. That's that's so fun. Yeah, that would be a fun uh, fun thing for a remaster too is like different weather events. Um, yes. Like, uh, like stronger winds, rain, uh, yeah, tornadoes. I don't know. That'd be, that would be very cool. That. Uh, so you, you'll be happy to know that uh, as part of the technical theme on all these projects that I'm on now, um, I, I get to just do technical wizardry um, and get better at procedurally generating both visual stuff and, and simulating stuff. So yeah. uh, like with the Rain World team, I work with them on a project they haven't announced yet, so I, I can't say too much. Okay. But they, I, I, I love them and what they're making right now. I want to check in with them to see how they're doing. But we worked on some very physics simulation-y stuff that looks amazing. Yeah. Um, and man, I wish I could show you some of it. Yeah. But uh, not yet. Um, um, and uh, like on some uh, some other project I'm doing right now, I'm simulating a slime mold, which is a kind of fungus that grows in really interesting patterns and is actually quite intelligent in how it searches for food and, and such. Wow, um, that's cool. Which is a lovely visual thing, but also yeah. like all the simulation stuff. And yeah, so uh, simulating ecology and actual detailed weather events like uh, like a hurricane or like a tornado or... Um, you are all over that. Uh, you're, already, uh, yes. you're already right there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You just you don't have to say much to me to get me started. Yeah. And then I'm like hyped for an, for an entire evening. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. Um, wow, that is really cool. Um, 
Dang, man. That's awesome. I think about yeah. <laughs> sometimes trying to get into writing music for games. Um, mm. Cause that, that and YouTube are like the, the two things that I've actually tried to do um, where I've put time and money into equipment and licenses and stuff like that to try and further myself cr- creatively. But um, I have never worked on a video game, but video games are so special to me. And so I think it'd be so fun to do that sometime. But uh, yeah. What's holding you back? I don't know. I have no idea. I, I mostly it is um, that I don't know how to make a game. And so I wouldn't be able to, I, I, I wouldn't have any idea of something to put the music to. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can, um, you can look for ways to kind of, uh, break the ice a little bit without having to go all in. Yeah. Um, one thing where certainly like in the past, like when I started learning programming, for example, everybody says make a 2d platformer first or something like that, instead yeah. of going for a 3d game, cause you get to kind of build it up in steps that way. I like being ambitious and throwing myself into the deep end, but that also means I get hurt every once in a while. Yeah. And so I've learned, especially later on, that no, you can actually do these things in steps and like get somewhere really quickly, but also in a stable way that you're sure of at every step. So you could try scoring some gameplay of some other game um, that you really like. Or, and try a, a bunch of different ones. Just find videos or make your own playthroughs and be like, well, what? how would this sound if I did it? I bet it would be different. I yeah. bet it would be very different if you did it. Yeah, that's really um, cool. I think one, yes. one of the things that I that I miss, and I know it's not it's not actually me missing anything. It's just I'm not looking in that space as much anymore. But I, I wish that the game jam kind of stuff was as big as it was in 2013. And I, and I don't know if that's, again, I don't know if that's just me not looking for it personally, but man, I would center like my whole YouTube channel just around highlighting stuff exactly like what I'm doing right now, like highlighting developers and, and creative people that have made something that's so strong and resonates with me. Um, I just don't know where to look. So yeah, that's, that's Ah. another area where I think, sorry to interrupt you. I think that's another area where I could find projects where they don't have music to them and i could i could you know be like oh i'm gonna make a little track for this in ableton and then (laughs) you know whatever yeah no um those spaces are around like there's lots of game jams still i think that yeah the culture may have changed or at least i haven't participated in them uh for for a while and you know like any movement it changes as it goes and as it matures and splits um so that that might be different Another simple recommendation I guess that I could give is you could try scoring things other than video games. You can try um, film or you can try uh, a live video of somebody running across the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, You can um, like try like whatever in terms of if you need a visual guide to create something to in terms of rhythm or sound Mm. find patterns that you like it could be anything it doesn't have to be video games um and start simple like be like okay i see this thing that i like i'm gonna spend five minutes putting sound to it and you'll probably do more than five minutes if the first thing that you put there sounds funny. Like you just put a single sound on there there and you're like, oh, that completely changes everything. Yeah. And then you you jam on that for half an hour and then you're like, well, that was that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, like you, if yeah. you can if you can do that without attaching to it or like without having super many expectations of it ought to be like this or it should, I, it should be something that my friends enjoy or that my yeah. parents can be proud of. None yeah. of that. Sure. Just put sound to images and have fun with it. That's cool. Yeah. That, that is, that is something that is really important as a creative person, I think to get past is like the, the ability to just finish something, even if it's not going to be seen by anybody, but just to like grow as a, as an artist. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm young, I'm 21, so I'm still learning the things that I'm interested in and passionate about. 
and I work a nine to five office job. So I, I, it's, it's hard for me to, to invest time in those spaces, but, but having an opportunity mm. to do things like this and just, yeah, shoot the shit and, and, uh, and learn and, and talk is, is so cool. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your time today. Oh, you're, you're doing great by the way. Can I, Thanks. yeah, I should say that like you're a, you're a great interviewer and Thank I you. haven't heard your music yet, but I, I bet it would. Yeah. I'd like to listen to your tunes or your Thanks. sound, uh, every once in a while, just sent me stuff. And, um, no, you're, especially also like you mentioned, just meeting people and shooting to shit about creative stuff. Yeah. It's a great way to get inspired and fired up yourself. So yeah, definitely just keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep being curious and, uh, you'll find your way. I'm very confident about that. Thanks. All right, man. Well, uh, wrapping up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I got to eat something. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to say or a message for, for anybody? I, I, I will be including snippets of this in whatever video I make for my channel. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say to my audience anywhere that I can point them to go see your stuff and support you stuff like that? Oh, um, so chances are, well, if they're in the Netherlands, <laughs> they should ch uh, definitely check out the uh, IDFA or ITFA exposition next month in November. Uh, there's a piece okay. called Symbiosis there by a studio called Polymorph. Um, I'm uh, working on some stuff with them to spice up whatever that is going to be. Cool. Um, uh, I should probably tell you what that is. It's like um, you wear these suits that constrain your movement in addition to VR uh, uh, headsets, and you each play like a different alien creature in the oh, same wow. shared environment. And kind of like Rain World Light, like we don't have a lot of time to um, go into um, like an entire lifetime. But you're these creatures, you're in the same space, you find food, you see each other around, and in the end, you get together and you actually eat. Like, there's actual food that you eat while you're in this experience. Wow, it's, okay. Um, it's a fun one. So that if you're in the neighborhood, so unique. stop yeah. by. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Um, let's see. I don't and know, And then Max. obviously, um, I mean, the, uh, the itch.io page for, I, I, I'm looking into the camera here, the itch.io page for the Aurora Wager still has the donation link. So if any of the footage or the interview stuff from this video resonates with you or other people who are watching this, I will have that linked in the description. Of course, please check it out. Donate to these wonderful developers. Let them keep doing this cool stuff. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. You did my job for me. I there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. See, you're doing fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Martin. Uh, well, I appreciate your time today. This was so fun. Um, and yeah, I will be working on this uh, shortly here. And um, this, this might be, this might be the beginning of a, uh, of a new kind of thing that I do on my channel where I try and highlight uh, really talented developers that have made some really cool shit that has really resonated with me. So yeah. Sounds Appreciate like you it. got that together pretty there quick. Yeah, yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank you, man. This was amazing. I had yeah. a lot of fun too. This yeah. is so much fun. Thank Very you. Very cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Have a great rest of your night. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you later, maybe. Message you and stuff. All right. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Thank you so much. See ya.